What skills will make you stand out as a engineer at a FANG company? Or really, an engineer at any company? This is probably one of the most common questions I get asked after I finish interviewing a candidate. Often they want to know, what skills will I need to have ready already as I get ready to start my job at a FANG company? And I think most of them expect me to say something like streaming or distributed computing, Hive, some specific technical skill. And oddly enough, I often never answer with technical skills because I think most FANGs are very good at hiring smart technical people. And in order to stand out at a FANG, I often find that these are not the top skills you'll need in order to really drive impact. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another video with me, Ben Rogajan, AKA Razor Fist Long Lost Cousin also known as the Seattle data guy. For this video, I'm gonna focus on the skills that you will need to stand out as a engineer or data scientist at a FANG or really just any tech company, which you might be surprised to find that they're not all technical skills. There will be some that are a little more technical, but I think a lot of the things that stand out to me and the things that I've had to learn were not technical. Even though when I first started, I assumed I was gonna have to learn a ton of technical new things. These skills often had more to do with my ability to drive projects, influence other teams, and really just have that cross-functional relationship with other employees where I could communicate with them as well as understand what they were telling me in terms of their needs. And we're gonna kind of drive into why I think that is and kind of how you can take yourself from maybe more of a junior engineer who focuses on the technical concepts just something more of a senior engineer where you're really focusing on doing the right work with that let's start with number one which is influence and this is something i think that is somewhat connected to amazon's leadership principle of being right a lot so oftentimes i think a lot of engineers will often maybe under their breath after a project has failed be like oh i knew we should have gone a different direction or you know i always knew this was the wrong choice and they would have said nothing about it the entire project because for some reason either they didn't have the confidence or they didn't truly believe in their own concept and they just wanted to see if they were going to be right and oftentimes a lot of these things expect you that if you know what the right answer is is to actually drive that right answer forward that means one you need to be right a lot which is Amazon's leadership principle, but two, also have the ability to influence other people and drive them in that direction. And that's a much harder skill, especially when you're talking about trying to drive your manager. And this isn't something we all have right off the gate. Some of us are very good at being like political and kind of driving projects that way. But most of us, I think, especially as engineers are really focused on the tech and we don't often focus on driving decisions and projects in a certain direction, even if we know that projects should be going a completely different route. Than we're currently taking and so being right a lot combined with influence is an important set of skills that you can develop so being right a lot and having the ability to influence your coworkers as well as xfns is an important skill that you need to pick up as you're getting better as an engineer again when you're first starting out you're focusing on the technical bit because that's hard enough but as you grow it's important to figure out okay how do i actually drive projects do i need to communicate more often do i need to bring in a manager sometimes you need to bring in more stakeholders in order to drive a project in a certain way if you think you're going the right way you need to have the data i think that's another thing that's very very constant in all of these projects and companies is you need to have the data to actually back up the fact that the decision you're taking, the route you're picking is the right decision. Now, from a practical side, in order to actually start having the skill, you're gonna have to start practicing having a voice, which means when you think something is wrong, or when you think a certain project should be done, take action, just talk to your manager about it. That's kind of step one. Have the habit of actually talking to your manager when you think something is wrong or needs to be fixed, or maybe just that a new project should be focused on altogether. Have the ability to then back up your reasoning, and those are kind of the practical steps you can have to kind of start developing that skill and practicing that muscle. But this is a short YouTube video, so I'm not going to spend too much time digging into exactly how to do that. But if you have questions, comment below. Next, a little more on the technical side, which is somewhat related to the fact that I think a lot of us assume that being a good engineer means knowing lots of skills and knowing lots of technologies. I actually think good engineers know how to limit the amount of technologies that go into a system and not expand upon it. There are so many different solutions you have and so many different tools you can use that oftentimes it can be tempting to try to create a diagram of a project similar to the ones you might read in a Uber engineering blog article, which you know you can see these giant complex systems that are meant to manage billions of users. And you might look at your smaller project and think, I need to build exactly that. But I think a good engineer knows when to limit down their system and only include the pieces that they need and not try to let it blow up because every new component you add, you know, Flink, Kafka, Airflow, Presto, Hive, MongoDB, you know, just layering the system with all these fancy names makes it harder to maintain. And this is often a skill that takes some time because I think you almost need to develop a few systems that are over bloated with technology to kind of realize you need less. For those of you who don't know, I actually used to work in fine dining and this was a similar thing that I think young 
cooks and chefs have, which is you often want to put 30 things on a plate because you have all of these techniques you've learned, all of these skills you've learned, and you want to show it all off. But I think more experienced and mature chefs, as well as more experienced engineers and mature engineers, understand that in order to make a solid system, the simpler you can make it, the fewer components you can use, the more maintainable it is. So consider that next time you're trying to build a complex system. Instead of trying to overbloat a system, think about how you can take away pieces and simplify it and be a more mature engineer rather than one that just wants to show off every skill that you have, figure out exactly what the system needs rather than letting it blow up very quickly and start using again every component possible, right? Like, oh, suddenly we need machine learning for something where maybe some simple business logic would have done just as well because that's much easier to implement and much easier to maintain in the long term. And these are concepts that as you progress in your engineering journey, you'll actually learn and pick up because it's just part of the natural process. You'll, you'll start to, I think, realize that less is more and sometimes complex isn't always better. So that's the second point I would say, you know, try to create simple systems rather than trying to overbloat it with all the technologies you've learned in every article you've ever read. Trust me, I know it's a lot of fun to make very pretty diagrams filled with complex systems that you don't necessarily need to support. Now let's re-dive into the soft side of skills. And I think I'm gonna jump inside now before it gets too dark out here. Now, before diving any further, a special thanks needs to go out to all of my lovely subscribers. We've hit 10K. Thank you so much to all of you. We will be doing kind of like some sort of special video for that. I'll probably be reviewing uh, some resumes again, and we'll see what else I can do for this 10K special. Also, if you haven't already liked and subscribed, take a moment to do that. I think at this point, we've got somewhere in the range of like 60% of you just watching and not subscribing. I really do appreciate all of you. And I thank you so much for all of the likes, shares, subscribes. Please feel free to keep doing that. Other than that, let's jump back into it. Prioritization is a skill that is also very important as you are an engineer because your time is very valuable. Oftentimes engineering roles have upwards of a 100K paycheck. So your time is highly valuable and everyone wants a piece of it. Being able to actually prioritize which projects are most important and which ones you should be focusing on is an important skill. And now depending on the company you work for, sometimes you have to prioritize, sometimes your manager might, but overall it is important that you can at least have an earnest conversation with your manager to tell them, hey, I currently have, you know, project A, B, C, D, I can only do project A, B. And if these other ones need to be moved in front of it, we need to have a conversation with our XFNs or we need to hire more employees. And now not every company can do the hiring more employees part. I think that's something that's probably a little more unique towards Fangs where they have a little bit higher profit margins, but if that's what needs to happen, sometimes staff augmentation can occur, otherwise hiring contractors and consultants. You just need to be upfront with your manager to tell them, honestly, this is all the time that I have. I can't do more than X, Y, Z and go forward from there. This is honestly something I'm still learning somewhere. I think a few months ago, I found out that for the longest time in my life, I was actually terrible at prioritization. What I was really, really good at was outworking a lot of my problems, which is great until you have more problems than you have hours in the day. So this is why prioritization is important because at the end of the day, we all only want to work so much and we only can work so much unless we're being forced to do 996, which thankfully is not yet uh, implemented in the US, but who knows? I'm sure there are plenty of managers and business owners who would love that to exist here in the US. So be honest with your manager and make sure they understand what time you have manage that because otherwise no one else will manage it for you and you will be overwhelmed and actually you'll arguably end up looking worse because instead of finishing two or three projects solidly you might finish none of the 10 projects you get assigned so it's better to finish three projects well than not finish the 10 that you're hoping to finish in that imaginary world where you have infinite time so time management is number three next if you want a useful skill learn how to reverse engineer someone else's thinking I say this as a consultant in particular, because I am now coming into two different systems that I did not develop and I'm having to go back and reverse engineer the entire system piece by piece, understanding complex ETL systems that were developed using custom code, which makes me cry, but I understand. Hopefully we're moving away from uh, developing custom code ETLs and either focusing on tools like Airflow and manage workflows for Apache Airflow, or doing things like low code solutions like Fivetran or Rivery or Stitch, Singer, Airbyte. Really, there are so many solutions. There are no more excuses for custom coding data pipelines, but we'll see what happens there. Regardless, being able to go into someone's system, reverse engineer it, understand what they were thinking is a super valuable skill. Whether that system was developed well or poorly is irrelevant. You're gonna have to do it a lot as a engineer, 
whether you're at a big company where maybe someone has left that team and that expertise has left, or maybe at a company that only ever had one engineer, two engineers speaking with, and they're both gone and everyone's looking to you to suddenly be the smartest person in the room when it comes to software engineering or data engineering. Don't be surprised. This happens much more often than you think. I've definitely already seen it happen three or four times this year on products that I've worked on. So it is not uncommon. Plus, then you become the expert in that system and now you have job security. So being able to reverse engineer people's thinking is highly valuable. And it does require a combination of both, I think like empathetic understanding of how someone developed a system as well as some technical know-how of how to actually trace back a system. Next, jumping back over to soft skills, ownership. That is a weird thing that is often tested for in a lot of things because they want to see that you don't just do the work that you're told to do. Again, this is somewhat tied to influence and being right a lot, but this is kind of its own unique thing, which means you're actually owning the work that you take on. It's one thing to be told, hey, build me this function or build me this data pipeline. And it's another thing to be like, hey, I spearheaded this project. You know, I ran this project. I drove this initiative because I thought it was important. And having that ownership comes out a lot in your interviews. There they're often testing for this in interviews when they're asking you questions. They're trying to figure out, hey, what was your actual role in this project? Was it more of just a coder or were you actually someone that owned the work that you were doing? And in particular for fangs that are often paying you upwards of 200K, if you're an engineer, this is highly important because they're spending a lot of money on your role and they wanna make sure they're getting the most out of you as possible. And part of that is making sure that you are actually owning the work and they're not actually having to have a manager manage you all of the time. So ownership is a highly important skill that you need to start thinking about how you can do a lot more than just, again, do what you're told, but actually take ownership of that project. That means sometimes taking an email when things get stuck, that sometimes means drawing up project plans or design plans or something similar, you know, putting together a design doc to just show that you actually care for more than just the work that you're doing, this small function that you're trying to solve, but you actually care about the big picture of the business. And this is why ownership is highly valued at most of these large tech companies. Another skill that I think is very important for everyone to develop, again, this is actually for engineers, non-engineers, anyone to be better in life is a bias for action. And again, this is an Amazon leadership principle, but this is something that I've lived on. And one reason I've made this YouTube channel is just sometimes it's a good idea to just do things versus waiting until the right moment. And this is something that most of these tech companies, again, expect you to do is don't wait for someone to tell you now is the time for this project. Just do it. You know, don't wait for the permission of the world to tell you, hey, now's the time to start a YouTube channel. Now's the time to build that project at work. Now's the time to learn that new skill. You need to just do it. To quote the famous philosopher Shia Buff, just do it. That is often something that is holding a lot of people back is they're waiting for the exact moment or they're waiting for the world to give them permission to do whatever it is that you're dreaming about. And I'm not saying like start up a business tomorrow, quit your job, but start small. Just start with some sort of proof of concept. Even when I started this YouTube channel, you look back five months ago when I was really actually turning into making this more of a YouTube channel, less than something I did occasionally, you'll see that I was leaning over my kitchen counter, filming with my laptop camera, I might add, and just kind of was speaking into this microphone. And once I realized, you know, one, I'm getting actually not terrible views for arguably some not great quality content, I decided to then buy this desk and go from there. And that's kind of how you need to do it. Instead of waiting for the perfect next step, just do it. Just take on some sort of proof of concept so you can show your managers, hey, this is a good idea. Look, you know, we, we built this product and it's getting traction or we've built this product and we think it'll be worthwhile based off of these numbers. Just doing things I think can separate you a lot in any field, but especially I think in engineering where we often I think just wait for someone to tell us what to do. Acting out and doing what you think is the right next step really makes you stand out amongst your competitors. Even if you're wrong, you often pick up little lessons along the way that can separate you. And I think it is a very important skill for engineers to have. It is that bias for action. It is what makes us better. It is what I promise will separate you. As long as that action is not dropping a production table. Again, start with some proof of concept and then go from there. I do find it interesting when people ask me the question, what skills should I have to make me stand out at a FANG or again, any tech company? I assume most people are expecting to, again, to hear something in the technical realm. But there's just so many other skills that help drive projects forward that have nothing to do with technical expertise, but help you have a larger impact in a company. Also, I think most companies that hire you assume that you already have the technical know-how. Really, in order to stand out, it is those softer skills and that ability to manage yourself, manage people around you, influence people around you that will make you stand out as an engineer, as a data scientist, and will get people to notice you. Honestly, if I were to look back at when I started to work at a thing, I would have expected the same answer. It's 
kind of what we think. We just think that all problems are technical problems. But I like to say technical problems are easy to solve. People problems are hard to solve. People don't respond the same way computers do, right? With computers, there is an expected output. If the code gives you the wrong output, it's because your code or your software is wrong, not because the software system is random. Software, code, programming, it's all generally some form of expected output. You put something in the function and something comes out that you can generally trace back to why you got that output. Again, technical problems are often easy. It's often the people problem that is hard to solve. So for my younger engineers out there, I'd say keep focusing on your technical skills. But if you're more in that mid-level space, I'd say focus on some of these more softer skills and making sure you're ready to actually influence, impact, have ownership, actually drive things forward, because that's what's going to make you stand out to all of your managers, to directors, and will really make you, I think, stand out in terms of like a cut above the rest kind of mentality. It's weird, I know, but it does make a lot of sense. Now, for all of you still watching this, thank you so much. You guys are helping me support the MBFR fund. It really means a lot to me. And if you would have told me a few months ago that I'd already be at 10K, honestly, I don't know if I would have believed you, but we're here now and let's get off to 20K and see where we can go from there. Thank you so much for your time and I will see you guys next time and goodbye.